We are continuing the conversation, or should I say lesson, on what is supply chain. And in today's video, we're going to learn what is the objective of a supply chain. This is part of our learning logistics series. And if you want to catch up on lesson number one, I'm going to link them in the description or in the cards or somewhere below. I'm Professor Rodriguez. I'm a college instructor, supply chain executive, and the co-founder of the MVC Logistics Academy, a place to find supply chain education, news, career development, and much more. This is part of our learning logistics series, and this is lesson number two. What is the objective of a supply chain? So let's get right to it. The objective of every supply chain should be to maximize the overall value generated. Now we're gonna learn about this and we're gonna really break this down in this particular lesson. So let's go to the next slide. The value a supply chain generates is the difference between what the value of the final product is to the customer and the cost that the supply chain incurs in filling that customer request. Now, in this particular area, we need to get a little bit more technical and we need to call the value that the supply chain generates as supply chain surplus. That's what we call it, supply chain surplus or the value that the supply chain generates. And what is calculated is as the difference between the value of the final product that the customer understands or the customer is willing to pay against the cost that the supply chain eventually generates with all its different parts and, and all these different processes and all these different activities and how much it costs us in the supply chain to make all of that happen. So again, the value, that's what we end up calling, and this is what we're gonna use as far as terminology moving forward, this is gonna be known as supply chain surplus. So keep that in mind. Now, as I mentioned before, this is what we know as the supply chain surplus. And this is sort of a little bit of a formula that you could think of if you're more of a visual person that needs, you know, something to represent what the actual terminology will be. So this is what we, we have here. We have that the customer value subtracted from the supply chain cost is going to represent the supply chain surplus. So customer value minus supply chain cost is going to equal supply chain surplus. So this is very important that you understand this very early on because it is a basis or foundation as we move forward into supply chain management. And when we start to realize how we make our supply chain decisions and how we make them based on what is going to eventually end up being our supply chain surplus. All right. Good. So moving forward. So the value that a customer represents is really important in, in, in order for us to calculate the supply chain surplus. So we need to understand that the value of the final product may vary for each customer and can be estimated by the maximum amount the customer is willing to pay for it. So it makes sense, right? The value is given by the customer the value that they place on a particular item. And now all this is dependent on several factors, is dependent on, you know, what kind of brand is it? Is it a brand name? Is it a generic brand name? Is it something that the customer is going to appreciate enough to pay what price you, pri you put that product at or the company places at? So again, we need to understand that the value of the final product is going to vary from customer to customer is going to vary from industry to industry. It's going to vary depending on what we offer as an added value bonus to that particular product or service. So we need to understand that in order to continue to learn about the value in our supply chain. Now, an added layer to this is that the difference between the value of the product and its price remains with the customer as consumer surplus. Now, the rest of the supply chain surplus becomes supply chain profitability and the difference between the revenue generated from the customer and the overall cost across the supply chain. Now, as I mentioned, the rest of the supply chain surplus becomes our supply chain profitability. 
Now the definition of supply chain profitability, so we know exactly what is the definition of the textbook definition, is that supply chain profitability is the difference between the revenue generated from the customer and the overall cost across the supply chain. All right, so this is what we need to understand now that we know what is supply chain surplus and we understand that sometimes we have a consumer surplus. And then on top of that, that will eventually become supply chain profitability. So revenue against what we have as costs. And because I want you to really understand this point, we're gonna take it into an example or a real world example. And in this case, we're gonna talk about Best Buy. Okay, so we're gonna imagine that a customer is purchasing a wireless router from Best Buy for $60. That's what they pay, they pay $60 for this wireless router. Now, I don't know if they're cheaper or more expensive now, but this is what we're gonna use as far as the example. So just keep in mind, we pay the $60. Now the $60 that are paid represents the revenue that the supply chain is receiving. At this particular point in our supply chain with the customers walking into the Best Buy and they're purchasing that router for the $60, that's where we have the revenue input from the customer with the $60 representing that. Now the customer who purchases a router, they clearly value that router at or above $60. Thus, part of the supply chain surplus is left with the customer as consumer surplus. Think of it this way. If the customer before walking into Best Buy looked around or shopped around and compared prices, they knew that this particular router and that brand was $10 more expensive at, say, Target. They decided that because Best Buy was cheaper in price for the same router, that they were going to go into Best Buy and buy that router for $60 instead of $70 or $75. That difference between those two prices and what the consumer le leaves with as far as difference in price is what we know as a consumer surplus. Now the rest stays with the supply chain as profit. So the $60 will stay with the supply chain as profit. And Best Buy and other members of the supply chain have incurred cost to actually get that product on the shelves. For example, there's cost to convey information, there's produ to produce components, to store them, to transport them, and to exchange funds or money between all these different members in their supply chain. Now, the difference between the $60 that the customer paid or the input of the, of the revenue from the customer and the sum of all these costs that are associated or incurred by the supply chain to produce and to distribute that router represents the supply chain profitability. Now supply chain in this sense profitability is the total profit that's going to be shared across the different supply chain members and intermediaries. The higher the supply chain profitability, well, the more successful a supply chain will be in general. So it's not always about who has the most profitability, but it is good to have a high number on that because it represents that the revenue is getting distributed among these members in a higher number. Okay, so why should we care about all these different terms, surplus, profitability, revenue, cost, well, we need to do this in order to understand how we can build a successful supply chain. And that's what we do here in this part of the lesson. We're going to understand supply chain success and what are some of those factors in it. For most profit-making supply chains, the supply chain surplus is, is or will be really correlated with profits. Now, supply chain success should be measured in terms of supply chain profitability and not in terms of the profits at each of the individual stages. In an upcoming lesson, we will talk or we will start to focus on individual members' profitability and how they may lead to a reduction in the overall supply chain profits. And you'll start to see how that starts to click and, and connect and make a lot more sense in terms of calculating the success of a supply chain. But however, we need to know that a focus on growing the supply chain surface pushes all the members of a supply chain towards growing the size of the overall pie or revenue pie, as you can imagine. 
Now, once you once you start, once you're able to define the success of a supply chain in terms of supply chain profitability, then the next step is really to look for the sources of value, revenue, and cost. We do this because we need to understand and really know where we can identify what creates value in our supply chain, what creates revenue in our supply chain, and what creates or generates cost within our supply chain in order to really be able to manage all these different activities efficiently. Now, this here is one of the points that we need to make very clear, and I think I, I I really aim towards making sure that the students understand this. If you go back to lesson one, you heard me say that the customer is the driver of the supply chain. And it gave you sort of an analogy of a vehicle being our supply chain, all the different parts within the vehicle, their components being the, the parts to this vehicle that are the machine that becomes the supply chain. But who really gets behind the wiggle and who drives these supply chains is really the customer, meaning they give direction to the activities that we do within our supply chains. So this is another added level to that. We need to also understand that for any supply chain, there is only one source of revenue, and that is the customer. That's it. Again, we have to remember that the value a customer places on a product or a service and what the company reflects is what they're willing to pay for those products and services. So hence why we call them the driver, why we give the customer so much emphasis when we talk about supply chain and supply chain management. And that is because the customer really and the, the actions and decisions that the customer takes and whether they support a products or services with their monetary input, it really affects how the rest of our supply chains flow and how the rest of our supply chains actually function or if they're successful or not. So again, I need to make sure that you, this, to drive this point across that the only source of revenue within supply chains are the customer. Okay, so we're gonna continue looking at the lesson and we're gonna look at a second example or example number two. And this time we're gonna take it back to Walmart. You know how much I love them and you know their whole supply chain uh, exercises and examples because there's so much information out there for Walmart. So that's why I love to use them. Example, we're going to take it back to lesson number one and the example that we had in this lesson and what is supply chain. And we talked about in this lesson about Walmart. And we imagined a customer who goes to a Walmart store to buy laundry detergent. Now, Walmart is a great example of this because, as I mentioned in lesson one, we talked about the customer walking into a Walmart and buying laundry detergent. And we have talked about the process it takes for the bottle of laundry detergent to actually be ready for the customer to buy it once they walk into a store and what that looks like. But now here in lesson number two, we will use the same example, but we're gonna use it to illustrate how the customer determines the value of a product and the value that the company represents to them providing the product. Now, the value that a customer places on a brand that they purchase at Walmart or in the company of Walmart themselves it really is dependent on a couple of factors. And, and I want you, while you listen to this and while you think about this and learn this, I really want you to take a step back and think about the brands that you purchase and the reason why you purchase these brands and why you make those decisions at the moment that you're purchasing these items and these products or services and why you're deciding to buy them. And if you start to do that, you're gonna realize that these decisions are based on a couple of factors or a couple of things that push you in the direction of making those decisions and those purchases. It could be that maybe you like this particular brand of toothpaste because it offers a particular favor you enjoy, or you purchase that particular type of cereal because a great commercial that you saw on TV influenced you to actually make that purchasing decision, or you purchased um, this particular brand of orange juice because of the price that is, that is priced at, at that particular store. So as you do this, you're going to start to see and realize that the decisions you make as a consumer, as a customer of Walmart and their brands really has on the different items that you purchase for your home and your own use or your own consumption. So when we look at that, this makes a little bit more sense and it starts to become a little bit more familiar. So here we have in this slide the Walmart's customer value factors. Now, the value obtained by a customer purchasing detergent, if we take it back to that example, 
at Walmart really depends upon several factors. Some of those that we're just going to list here, we're not going to list all of them, but some of them could include, for example, including the functionality of the detergent, meaning how does the detergent that they're going to purchase work for that particular uh, customer? Another factor could be the convenience of location. How far does the customer have to travel to Walmart to actually make that purchase for that laundry detergent? Another could be the availability of product inventory and the likelihood of the customer walking into that Walmart and finding the detergent that they need in stock. I mean, you and me, I know I have experienced that if I go to a particular store and they're out of the item or they're out of stock out of the item that I need, it's it's an inconvenience because then you're going to have to go into another store or you're going to have to make the decision to buy it online or you're going to have to find an alternate solution to getting the product that you need. And if we add that, you know, that obstacle for the customer to overcome, we don't know if that customer will return and make the purchase from us or they'll go to somewhere else or another competitor to make that purchase. So it's important to understand how customer and how value is created for a customer and how these factors influence them. Now, these are just a few, and this is just a brief little touch on what that could be. And as we move forward in the lessons, we are going to focus more on what the customer relationship management strategies are to have the customer place a particular value on the brands for our products. All right. So let's move along. This sort of circles us back to the point that we made earlier and that all of this ultimately means that the customer is the only one providing positive cash flow for that Walmart supply chain. All other cash flows are simply funds that are being exchanged that occur within the supply chain and that are given to the different stages that have different owners. Now, when the Walmart supplier or when the Walmart pays its supplier, it is taking a portion of that fund that we received from the customer and we're passing that money or those funds along to the other parts or the other stages of the supply chain. And we repeat this process both going forward and backwards. And this is part of, again, taking it back to lesson one, it is taking it back to what flows or what are the supply chain flows. We have material, we have information, we have finances. And those are the things that are always moving at all times within our supply chain network or our supply chain matrix. So it is important to know that that added part of that matrix or that added part of that network is the customer providing that cash infusion into our supply chains because they're the only ones that are doing this in a positive manner, meaning a revenue, an, an increase in our funds. Then us, or I should say Walmart, as the retailer where it's collecting those funds, they have to then distribute them as they place orders, as they get more inventory, as they pay their suppliers and so forth. So you have to think of it that way, all right? And that's why we emphasize that the customer is the only one providing positive cash flow within a supply chain. Okay, so we understand what is the objective of a supply chain now. We understand what creates value in a supply chain and how the customer is the one that infuses our supply chains with cash flow. Now we have to start to learn or understand how do we manage a supply chain? Now we know the elements, we know all of it, but now how do we manage our supply chains? As you can imagine, all the flows of material, information, and finances that are generated within the supply chain, they need to be managed. These flows generate cost within the supply chain and being able to manage them correctly is how we maintain healthy and successful supply chains. So it's not just knowing what's happening in our supply chains, but it's being able to control and manage them. Because the better we do this, that means that we're going to have costs that are not uh, astronomical and we can control them. And that means that we know where everything is going when it should be going. Right. So everything about supply chain and supply chain flows is about managing them. Now, how do we do this? 
we do this through the use of supply chain management strategies. So here we're going to look at supply chain management and how it comes into play. Now, by definition, supply chain management is the active management of supply chain activities to maximize customer value and achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. Now, these activities focus on the management of the supply chain assets and products, information, and fund flows to maximize the total supply chain surplus. So as you can see, we're taking it all the way around, right? We're getting all the supply chain flows. We're understanding how they work, how to manage them, and how that creates the highest or how we maximize the total supply chain surplus within our supply chain structure. Now, this is very crucial because a growth in supply chain surplus increases the size of the total pie, allowing contributing members of the supply chain to benefit. So the more that we control, the more that we grow in a way that is structured correctly, then the bigger the pie and the bigger the slice of the pie that each of the members of the supply chain will benefit from. All right. So th the more the more we can actually control these and manage the growth of these activities in a way that reduces costs, maximizes profits, then that means that everybody in our supply chain is going to be happy. So this is where we start to look at the importance of supply chain decisions. And knowing how to manage a supply chain effectively is all about knowing the importance that decisions we make can have on our supply chains. So as I mentioned very early on, right? As we move forward, we start to see how these different elements and these definitions and these terms really come into play to the day-to-day -day activities that we have within our supply chains and the decisions that we make. In teaching about supply chain, I like to really make an emphasis on analyzing all supply chain decisions in terms of their impact on the supply chain surplus. This is because every decision made has an impact on the overall supply chain and can vary for a wide variety of reasons. Now, decisions made at the upper level can have impacts or make an impact on the way that we operate the day-to-day -day activities or how we run those operations and vice versa. The day-to-day -day operations can impact the decisions that the upper management has to take. Now, that is why this will be the focus of the upcoming lessons and what we're going to look at into the next parts of our learning logistics series. So for now, this is where we're going to end lesson number two. And next, you'll have lesson number three, where we're going to talk about supply chain management decisions and how they affect the supply chain. As always, thank you for watching. I will be creating more content for you, so please stay tuned. And if you're interested in a free download of a great supply chain management career resource, check out the link in the description below for a free download of our career and life assessment, which is a great little tool I created for students and any kind of supply chain professional that's looking to really narrow down what they should be doing in their careers within the industry. That is all for today. We'll call her a wrap. I'm Professor Rodriguez. See you in the next one. Bye.